My name is Edgar B. Herwick III. I am with WGBH. I'm uh, with what we call our Curiosity Desk. Uh, but tonight, I'm going to guide you through our Boston right. Talks. Just so, uh, Kara Seidemann uh, is our first speaker. She's a transportation program manager for the city of Cambridge. She oversee oversees their bike sharing program, Hubway. Uh, we're going to bring her up to the stage here. She's, uh, she's got lots of ancillary uh, items for her, uh, for her talk. But Hi. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions that I want you to actually answer. They're not rhetorical. How many people biked here tonight? Whoa. All right, keep your hands up, because if you keep your hands up, then you're going to receive something. So just keep them up. Um, <clears throat> and my, my helpers are handing out things. And Benji, there's some more of those in the back. So if you could grab some um, behind the stage in a red bag. OK. So when my niece was about six or seven years old, um, she had already had a lot of exciting adventures in her life. She went to summer camp in the Alps, she traveled all over the world, went to big cities like Paris and London and New York, went to amusement parks and camping trips and everything. Another thing she did was spend a couple of weeks every summer at Chautauqua, New York. Does anybody know what that is? Yes, yay. So for those of you who don't, it's a little um, sort of arts and education community on a lake in western New York. And it's a place with limited traffic, so all the kids arrive there and get bike on their bikes immediately. And um, after one particularly busy summer, I asked my niece what was her favorite thing that she had done that summer? What was her favorite vacation that she'd ever had? And she said, Chautauqua. And I asked her why. And she didn't, without hesitating, she just said, I like it because I can get around by myself. And I, I spent a whole minute of my time with this story because I think it encapsulates what is so wonderful about biking, which is the sense of independence and freedom it gives people in many, many ways. Um, I asked, in fact, the members of the bicycle committee, the Cambridge Bicycle Committee last night, what do they like about biking? And several of them use that word, freedom. Uh, many of you may feel this as well, I think, whether it's remembering the independence you had as a child or feeling the wind in your hair or just the pure convenience of getting around on your own steam and in your own schedule. Um, there's a commuter survey that was done a few years ago and people were asked why they liked biking to work. And my favorite quotation was from a guy who said, I like it because my ride doesn't stop mysteriously between stations. <laughs> so, sense of freedom, convenience, what other reasons? So call out, what other reasons do you like biking? Why, why do you like it? Exercise. Exercise. Affordable. <laughs> there was many, many reasons. Faster than the car, faster than the bus. Who won the, the, the bike race on Tuesday? The Hubway. Um, so um, how many of you bike, you think, like maybe five miles about um, on a regular basis, in a, like a ride? Congratulations, you guys have just added a couple of years onto your lives. There are studies that show that people who bike regularly live longer and they're healthier. And what people are saying here today exemplifies the reasons behind the growth and popularity in bicycling. Um, and it is growing tremendously. I think you all know this and you see it and we actually have, have the data to prove it. Cambridge has tripled the number of people who are biking in the past decade. Um, and we've done some calculations to show, um, to translate this into millions of bicycle miles traveled. So in the last year we did these calculations. Who wants to guess how many million bicycle miles traveled there were in Cambridge? And if somebody gets close, then I have a thing for you, a prize. Um, and I'll just say that we didn't count every single cyclist in the whole city. We counted the major corridors of, of cyclists and then translate that. So this is million bicycle miles traveled in a year. Anybody want to take a wild guess? Who said 16? 16, it's 15, so, 15, so we'll say that. That's, that's good. Okay, there you go. Um, how many people here own a bike, their own bike? <laughs> Excellent. Um, and in Cambridge, actually, there's more bikes that are owned than cars. For every 100 households, there's 169 bikes. Even though two-thirds of the, of the households own bikes, for a lot of those households, they own many, many bikes. How many people here own more than one bike? Exactly. 
Um, so Hubway, ta-da. Um, yay. How many people here are Hubway members? OK, now keep your hands up again, and you're going to get something different. Um, keep your hands up until you get that thing in your hand. Hubway, Hubway fits neatly into the freedom and convenience categories. It gives people a lot of options, one where they don't have to think about the maintenance of the bike or where it's going to be parked or what if you want to take one-way trips or any number of reasons. Um, connects to transit so you can come at, from outside of the city. And um, this enables more and more people to, uh, to ride and more types of people to be able to choose to ride. And you can ride sometimes and not other times. Um, and anyone know about how many trips have been made to, it, by Hubway to date? The system's been in place about three years, started a little bit in 2011 in the in larger sense in 2012 in uh, Cambridge, Somerville, Brookline, in addition to Boston. Somebody take... Three million. Who said three million? Okay, so you come and get your tchotchke. I'm not going to throw it that, that far away. <laughs> It's, it's almost three million, and it can't be Benji. <laughs> um, who here bikes in the winter? Yeah, sometimes, right? So one of the things that, what, it, what did you notice about Hubway in the winter? So Cambridge has kept it going throughout the whole winter, the last two years. And we've had 35,000 trips in a winter the first year and 51,000 in the second year. And um, if anybody noticed, it was actually the most reliable form of transportation because our great Hubway crew kept it shoveled out year-round. We have a couple of Hubway people in there. Um, so another fun fact, what's the most used Hubway station in the system? None of the above, so nobody gets the thing. No, it's MIT. Um, mm -hmm. All of those, so six of the top ten are in Cambridge, by the way. Um, there are uh, 855 cities in the world who have bike share systems, um, which is pretty amazing, and is really transformative. Um, so for all of you who have a Hubway membership, you've received a card. So your mission during the break is to find someone who is not a Hubway member and give them that card and tell them why Hubway is great and why they should try it out. Um, so. Just to wrap it up, to back to my niece, why could she bike by herself? Um, why did she have that sense of independence? Because she was in an environment where it was really safe and comfortable for her to bike. And this is the kind of thing that is our mission, is to try to create something where it can be really safe and comfortable for anybody who wants to bike. Um, one of the things that makes it also really safe for people to bike is lots of people biking. And the more people biking, the safer it is for everyone. And we want to get a lot of people um, to feel like they can make that choice and also make that choice for their kids. To, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a city where you could bike with your kids around to school or to wherever they want to go? Um, so one of, Cambridge has been working on creating a bicycle network plan, a kind of vision for what we want to see the city to look at, look like. Has anybody actually commented or participated in any way in the Cambridge plan? I hope there's a few people who have. Um, so we, had, we did surveys. We asked a lot of people. And clear, it was very clear that people want to have more facilities, and in particular, things like protected bike lanes and things like that. So um, I'll end on a, couple, on a positive note and just tell you that a bunch of things are happening in Cambridge that are making things better. And it is going to be great when they're done. It's a pain in the neck to, to live through the construction. We are well aware of that. But there's going to be a Western Avenue cycle track completed. Cambridge Common Flagstaff Park adds a, a separated path and bike signals to help people traveling north out of Harvard Square. Cycle tracks are being constructed on Binney Street. Part of the Grand Junction path is going to be built. And the process is beginning to plan the rail trail in the Watertown branch in the Fresh Pond area. So, um, if that's not enough, then come and ask me more about what's happening. And um, I would really like to say thank you for coming and thank you for choosing to ride your bikes. All right, all right. Huge round of applause for Kara Siderman, who I was saying earlier, when I first looked at her name, I thought it said Spider-Man. And I was like, what an awesome name, Kara Spider-Man. <laughs> to which you said... When you were young, you hated that because this would happen, right? Yes, but now I think it would be way cool to have that name. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that has fascinated me about the Hubway thing is that, um, 
you know, in, in, in my work here at WGBH, we're often covering city politics and things that are happening. And this is something that has sprung up so quickly. And it's not just Boston, but you have Boston, you have Cambridge, you, you have these like Somerville, these municipalities all working together to make it happen. Um, how'd you guys do that? <laughs> like, <laughs> how much time do you have? How did, it, how did it sort of come together so fast? Or, or was there so much work behind the scenes before it actually happened that it just seems that way? I would say that that is true. There was a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, and the interesting thing about bike share in general is that it, it, it is one of these things that didn't exist really hardly anywhere like 10 years ago. And now you have 855 cities because it was so obvious the first time that something got put out that this was a, a solution that was just being waited, waited to be happening. Um, it's a little bit sort of bureaucratic about how it got started, but it was the Regional Transportation um, Agency, MAPC, that um, worked to gather, to, to create something so that many municipalities could participate. And I will give total snaps to the city of Boston for really getting the first major grants to fund it, and they really launched it, and then the rest of us came in. And then the other thing I will say is that we have a wonderful set of uh, private partners to help to make that happen. So the universities and my, my university is Harvard and, and MIT, I say my because they're in my city, um, chimed in and gave money, but lots of other private companies uh, contributed. And then the fact that everybody started joining and using, and it's just really clear that people wanted to have it happen. So we're investing more and more. Very cool. So, you know, one of the things that struck me when you were talking is about some of these things that are in the pipeline, some of these things that are coming yeah. down the pike mm -hmm. for, for bikers. And I'm guessing that you out there, all of you bikers, or most of you bikers, have some ideas, right, in your head about what you would like to see in your town. Is that right? You, you guys are out there and you, there are things that you think, why is this this way? This would improve. This would help. For people who are out there all the time, biking and they either have an idea or they see something that needs to improve in their municipality whether it's something small like there's a pothole right here or whether it's something larger like gosh you could totally turn this into a bike path why right. haven't they done that right. where where do you go with that mm -hmm. if you have that idea if you have that feedback that you want to give what do you what do you do with that so first of all i want you to raise your hand if you've ever seen something that you think needs fixing and I, if, I, if you're not raising your hand, I don't believe you. <laughs> so um, there, if you see something, so both Cambridge and Boston have a way that you can, um, you can say that there's an issue that needs to be repaired on the spot by using an app. So if you have a smartphone, there's something called iReport. You can download it for free. And it's very intuitive, and if you see a pothole or a broken bike rack or anything like that, the street light, you can report it on the spot. It goes into a system and is repaired pretty, pretty immediately. And that, in your experience, that's, that's effective? Totally effective, and the most effective thing that you can do. And Boston has one called Citizens Connect, which I think operates similarly, but I can't speak that I much see at it. least four people who just whip their cell phones out and are now like That's downloading what I want the app you to do. as you're talking. And it's really helpful, and the city will say, we will say, it's very helpful to do this because how, how can we know where everything is and things crop up? And so you're all like helping to make things better. If it's a longer team thing, we're going to be launching something on our website where you're going to be able to to give suggestions. You can always give a suggestion to um, city officials, but we're going to be launching something um, specifically around biking to give longer term suggestions. And then the other thing I would say is that if you really want a major thing to happen or you want to support one of the projects that's going on, pay attention to what's happening locally and speak up. And you should definitely go to a public meeting or write your city councilor and I can tell you these things matter, your voices matter. So I really, and you're, they, the, the cities are for you, so really participate, that's my biggest Answer. That's your biggest thing. Yeah. Participate. Everybody ready to participate? Yeah. Can you participate by giving a round of applause to Kara Siderman? <laughs> so we're going to bring our next, uh, our next speaker up here now, who I, I think it's fair to say would, um, would be behind the, the, the idea of not all bike rides or bicycle rides or cycle rides are created equal. I mean, that's essentially uh, what Bike About is about. She founded it in 2014. And she's going to come up and talk a little bit about what she does 
and why uh, she does what she does. So welcome to the stage, Megan Ramey. Let's hear it for her. Yes. Hello, y'all. Can you hear me? Can All you right, hear? I said hello, y'all. There it is. I'm from, I've spent 10 years in the South, if you can't tell, but it's still my favorite greeting because it's so warming. Um, so I have a quick story to help introduce me and Bike About, and that is up until about five years ago, our vacations, my husband and I and my myself, um, involved adventure travel. So jumping off of cliffs, rope swings into water, um, hiking to the bottom of the Grand Canyon without any plans whatsoever, um, New Zealand, just like things that you know you can do very much solo. And then my daughter was born, and so we couldn't do that very much anymore. And I was like, so what kind of travel? I, I'm a travel bug, if you haven't figured that out. And so I was like, what can we do now that is great for families? It's like, let's go to Amsterdam. <laughs> And why did I want to go to Amsterdam? For the thing that everybody goes to Amsterdam for, <laughs> which is <laughs> something the government fully supports and endorses. And people as young as three years old, even younger, slash those are 80, the 80 year olds do, and that was biking. And it changed my entire perspective of what traveling was meant to be like. Um, we had our daughter, she was like a year and a half. Um, I know that because we took advantage of the free flying before <laughs> she turned two. And the place we rented bikes from had a full, like exact same setup that we had here, which was a front mounted bike seat. We got around, there were bicycle highways everywhere. There were restaurants that were dedicated to the to the cycle routes there that we could stop at. Everything was about bike tourism or about the bike tourist. And so when I got home, I was like, now I have the munchies. <laughs> I want more. And um, so this is why my mantra is gateway drug for the bike curious, because <laughs> like marijuana, everything is, um, everybody has a different motivation for what gets them on a bike. And, and so I'm going to do less talking, actually, than um, I want you guys to talk, because I'm going to be using you as a little focus group. Um, my, first, my first round, and I want you, and I have swag to throw out, or you come up. I have these really nice waterproof bike saddles that were made on Etsy. And then I have sticker-like um, patches that you can put on your pannier. So. Raise your hands if you've biked since getting a driver's license. Okay, yes. Um, and if anybody hasn't, don't feel bad, because that's my whole thing, Gateway Drugs with Bike Curious, is like, I have a friend who hasn't biked and I'm desperate to get her on a bike. I'm just trying to figure out the angle. She really likes cupcakes, so I'm, <laughs> I'm working on that. Um, all right, so taking a friend on a bike ride. Awesome. Or taken 400 friends, like this past weekend the bike party managed to take. That was just fantastic. And if anybody doesn't know about bike party, please look it up, because it's a, a great social ride. Bike party. Woo. Um, biked in a new city on business or leisure. Fantastic. And so that's what really Bike About is all about, is getting people um, on bikes in a new city, um, essentially recreating your life here or staying like a staycation in Boston, um, just rethinking the travel that you do. It's not really about the bike, it's about the best way to see the city and get in the nooks and crannies um, and meet the locals and local restaurants. So, going back to my gateway drugs for the bike curious, um, first of all, that I just want people to throw out um, answers. What is stopping, if anybody hasn't biked or would bike more, what's stopping you from biking more in Boston? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yep. Yep. Okay. 
no. Yep. He said bad attitude towards bicyclists. Rain. Rain. Okay. Intersections. Yes. Yeah. Nice. So now switching, what prevents you from biking in a city when you're there traveling or there visiting for business? You don't know where to ride. Rent the bike, okay. I'm sorry, what was that? Right, okay. So family members might not. Okay, so in like the best city, what prevents you from in the best biking city, what prevents you from biking? No, okay. <laughs> uh, any other? Not having your helmet. Okay. Okay. So, n like, not a good route or wayfinding signage. <laughs> yeah, that can stop you. Um, so, and then flipping that. And so I would love for you to tell me, pic picture your perfect bike ride. Um, what are the elements it entails? And if, if whoever can name who I know is their top, top, like the top three reasons or top three elements that make a perfect bike ride, then, I, then you can have a saddle. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Connectivity, okay. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Flat, yes. Yeah. I'm missing two big ones. And it's not so much it's not so much the ride, it's what's you're stopping at. Who said ice cream? Seriously, that's the number one. Yeah, awesome. Get a saddle or a, yeah. That's what I meant about destination. Oh, yeah. So you have to be beer, it's second. That's number two. Yes. My last year in Seattle was all about beer. Yep, that's so so one another thing that inspired me besides hitting on the beer topic, um, besides the Netherlands was uh, a trip to Portland that I made. Um, my husband is really into beer, makes his own at home, and unfortunately I can't drink it because I'm allergic to gluten, which kills me being from Wisconsin. Um, and so I found this book called Hop in the Saddle, which you guys should all buy if you ever go and visit Portland because it's unbelievable. So it's a woman who is an advocate, a woman who is a journalist, and um, a woman who is a graphic designer, and they put together this book of craft beer seen by bike in Portland. So they narrowed down the 100 plus breweries to 30 you have to go to, and they divided it up into five neighborhoods with routes that would take you to all the best ones and why you needed to go there. And I was like, there needs to be something like this for every city, but bigger than beer, like somebody that's into public art, somebody that's into architecture, history. And so that was kind of my, that was the, the idea for Bike About. And all those barriers you guys named, um, that's what Bike About tries to solve is, so you need a bike, first of all. So we refer you to local bike shops that rent transportation bikes with lights and locks and helmets, if you want those. And then um, where to stay, if there's hotels that provide bikes for guests, um, Airbnbs and good bike-friendly neighborhoods. And then how to get there, like does an airline, bus, train, accommodate your bike and how much does it cost. Um, ferries are on there too for, for those that, that do have ferries, like the Menemesha, I always forget how to pronounce it, in Martha's Vineyard. Menemsha, yes, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, um, so that's, that's essentially bike about. And I have routes um, and that's the, that's the other big thing that we do is we work with local, like the Losing Burn Bur Burningham who did the hop in the saddle. I work with people like that that are really into something and biking is just kind of on the side and they curate a route of their favorite, their favorite bike ride of the city. And so go online, it's all free for the user. If you're ever traveling to a city, please look us up because I want you to see it by bike. And, and lastly, the last thing I really, this makes me so happy to see everybody here because 
Um, I've been on the board of Livable Streets for since 2008, and I've seen tremendous changes happen to this city, and it's all because of the advocates, advocates' work. So I want to shout out to anybody who's a board member. I have some here with me at Livable Streets, Boston Bike Union, um, Mass Bike, Walk Boston, even though it's not biking, we're still working together. And, and anybody else who volunteers or sits on a bike committee, we're changing the city and it's making a difference. And so Bike About pledges to donate 25% of our annual revenue back to local advocates because we need it. So, and, and that's all I have. All right, Megan, Megan Ramey, let's hear it for her. Come on, guys, let's hear it. Yes. So, you're, you know where all these great bike rides are all over the place from what you do. Slash routes. Sla so slash the, routes. Yeah. So slash rides routes. I would consider like a group ride. You're going with a bunch of people. I see. And routes you can kind of do on your own. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, recommendations around here. If, if people are used to just biking you know, in the, in the very near vicinity, where, where are some really sort of close places, maybe even under the radar, where people should think about heading to over the next few months? Yeah, so we just published, does everybody familiar with Night Shift? Yeah, yeah so the head, the head, one of the head brewers who founded it curated a route of his favorite craft beverages of the city, and so it's great because Kind of unfortunately, fortunately, all the good breweries are in the worst areas <laughs> of the town, so it's raising awareness that we need to improve our infrastructure around them. Um, and then there's the Left Bank Bike Ride, curated by Bikey Face, to take you to all the best arts hotspots in, in Somerville, Cambridge. Uh, I'm pretty partial to going out to Walden Pond and coming back on the train, or taking the train out and coming back. And there's just so many great, because we have an amazing train system, there's so many good like week, day trips that we can go on in this city. The Cape Flyer was huge in getting us out to, to Cape Cod, so. How about if people, what if, what if somebody's got like a, a sort of like a, a hidden gem of a, great, of, of a great route or something like that? Which, you know, how, do they, how do they get in touch with you about that? Being like, you know what you're missing is this thing right they, here. I, I put my business cards on the table. I'm always looking for new ambassadors, especially if you're, you're really knowledgeable and pa passionate about a particular topic and um, you want to write about it. That's the best, like the best part is the, the actual writing. I want like good descriptions. I call them mixtapes because people are always like, what if my route overlaps with somebody else's route or I pick a spot that somebody else picked? I'm like, but think about it like mixtapes. You identify more with the personality that's making the mix together for you than you do with actual where you're going. So yeah, I'm always looking for people to curate routes for us, especially in Boston. I expect for at least some of you to take advantage of that. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan Ramey, let's hear it for her one more time. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back with uh, Fortified Slava Men. So it was the summer of 2011. My best friend and I had just graduated from MIT Sloan. We packed up this monstrous U-Haul and drove all of our possessions from Cambridge to New York, and we moved into our tiny Lower East Side apartment. And we were working on our new startup. And this had been my dream before I started school. But somehow, I was actually miserable. You see, I felt trapped. I felt trapped in my tiny apartment. I felt trapped by, every time I went to a cr crowded New York City subway, I felt trapped by the $170,000 of debt that was over my head and the zero income that, that I was taking from my company. And uh, I was on this path that I didn't really want to be on. And in fact, I was so broke that the metro started to get expensive, so I bought this 1990s Gary Fisher bike for 50 bucks, and I used that to get around everywhere. And I found that uh, with that, I felt, as we had said before, I felt, felt this freedom. I wasn't confined to any schedule. I wasn't forced underground with a bunch of other sweaty people. I was free to go where I wanted. And I had this feeling of, when I biked, I had this feeling of flying. You ever get that feeling? 
You know, I felt like a little kid again. I was flying. And I found that I was actually smiling, which to you doesn't sound very unusual, but I was born in the former Soviet, Soviet Union. They don't really teach us how to smile. <laughs> they teach despair and anger. And in fact, like the neutral face, if you're from the former Soviet Union, just let your like resting disposition is kind of a little bit like this. It's a little bit like, like the, the guy next to you, maybe he didn't eat something right, or maybe he didn't bathe, you know, just like a bad smile. Try making this like, this, I call it the, this, the Soviet stinky face. Try, just give it a try, let's see it. <laughs> oh, I see some good ones. I saw, I saw a good one there. You won a prize. Excellent Soviet stinky face. Ooh, not a great paper airplane. Awful throw off a paper airplane. So anyways, I'm biking, I'm smiling, I feel free, and I decide I have to start a new company. And we start Fortified Bicycle, and we get the idea for it after a friend of mine had his bicycle lights stolen, and riding home that night, a car didn't see him and crashed into him. And he was okay, he didn't get hurt, but gave this idea for this unbreakable, unstealable gear. Um, and, to, uh, and then the larger mission, though, was that we figured that if we can protect people when they're biking, they're going to be more comfortable biking in cities. More people biking in cities means healthier people, happier people, better cities. And as our world is becoming cities, that was going to be the small dent that I wanted to place in the world, is to get people on bikes, help get people on bikes. So two years later, everything's going really well. And I'm you know, achieving this mission of helping getting people on bikes. And I had another submission. And I was working on manufacturing. And the reality was that sourcing products in the US was not a reality, because our bike lights would cost $400 if we made them in the US. So I'm in, I'm in China, in the back seat of a Buick, which is ironically the luxury car in China. And we're uh, four hours outside of Beijing, and we're driving along. And just to kind of let you know what the scene was like, I look out the window, and we're driving along this, this ravine or this ditch, and I couldn't understand because it was kind of moving. And there was shoes, and plastic, and styrofoam, and crap. And the reason it was moving is because it was actually a river. It wasn't a ravine. And there was you know, pockets of like brown and orange foam. And then beyond this river, there were these very neatly organized rows of corn. And I realized it was cornfields. But it doesn't look like cornfields in the US. They were kind of these yellow and brown cornfields. And interdispersed in these cornfields were these smoked stacks. Because it was a corn region, but it was also a brick making region. So these smoke stacks, coal power of force, and they were just vomiting huge amounts of black crap into the air. And it was on my skin, it was in my lungs, and I was coughing, and it was, and, and beyond these cornfields was, I can't tell you what's beyond these cornfields, because you actually couldn't see more than about a football field away. And I was on my way to maybe the 15th factory in a week. And the stuff that they're making in this factory, I realized, was the same stuff that they're shipping to this country that's ending up shipping to our country, and up in our landfills, or in their case, their rivers. And it's just com coming from crap that we buy that we don't actually end up needing. So I get into this factory, and I'm in there for just a few minutes, and my head just starts to really hurt. And I realize it's because it's an injection molding factory, and I'm breathing melted plastic. And I'm looking at the people, that, and I've just been there for a few minutes. I'm looking at the people that have been there, and it's like, it just kind of felt like I was at a zoo. And there's like these you know, poor things that were stuck there. And I almost lost it right there. I just want to scream. I just want to scream, like, don't you see? Don't you see what you're doing? Don't you see what you're doing to these people, to these farms, to your country, to our world? Don't you see? Making this crap that you don't need, that people don't need, and that can ends up in landfills. And then I th so I, d I didn't say that. That's what I wanted to say, but I didn't say that. I said, let's go. And we got back in the car. We had a very long, quiet, polite drive back to Beijing. And I had some, some time to think. And I kind of was thinking back on, you know, the way I was doing things. I was thinking back on being at, at a Walmart and buying a toaster because it was on sale. I didn't actually need a toaster. I bought it because it was on sale. You guys ever do that? I do that. And then I remember being, and then I remember that toaster breaking. I remember buying another one on Amazon just because it was easy. It was one click away, you know? And I buy these things, and they end up on my shelf. And then they end up, uh, you know, a year later, I end up disposing them some way. And I realized that, in the past, I had been part of this cycle of production, consumption, destruction, destruction, but I didn't really know any better. But now that I'd been there, I knew better. And I felt like I had to do something about it. And I was really torn. I was at a crossroads. You know, do I continue to make products in this, in this, in this country in this way? 
Or do I not do that? And do I shut down Fortified and let down my team and let down my investors, let down myself? And I decided, I, I started, I was, had a lot of time to think on this drive and I remembered something that one of my uh, adv uh, advisors had said, Bill Warner, he's uh, uh, actually a bike maker, a hand bike cycle maker, and an entrepreneur and founder of Avid Technologies. And he said this to me in passing, but it somehow it hit me at that point. He said to me, Slava, I love products that understand their world and last and last and last. So think about that for a second. Understand their world. So a product that, it's kind of like a friend that you can rely on. It knows what you need. It's there for you. You know, it's not buying something as I buy on the internet and it arrives and I'm like, oh, that's not quite right. Let me buy another one and put this one on a shelf. It's, it's there for you. So products that understand the world. And lasts and lasts and lasts. Think about when your grandparents bought a toaster. I bet they have that same toaster 50 years later, right? That's the way our grandparents bought things. The way that we buy things is that we, we upgrade. Upgrades didn't exist you know, in our grandparents' generation, but what we do is we upgrade because we buy products that essentially are disposable. So I had this realization, and what we decided to do is we decided to take a harder path, which was instead of going with the lowest price factories, we were going with factories that we visited that were U.S. and European quality. So you walk in there, it's like being a factory in the U.S. and Europe. And we even went to their suppliers and saw that the working conditions and the quality of what they were doing and the way that they were disposing of things met these standards. And it meant that we were spending more money and having smaller profits, but it meant that I was satisfied with what we were doing and the feeling of making products that are designed to last and last. So we're in Boston, highly educated city, entrepreneurial city, city of inventors, and I know there's people in this room, actually I met uh, Victor earlier, who you, you guys bike every day and you have ideas. And you say, there's this product and it doesn't quite understand its world. And you may not be phrasing it that way, that's your thinking. Like, why does it do this? I got a better way. Has anybody had this, you said, there's a better way of making a product? You have these ideas, right? Give me a Soviet stinky face if you. <laughs> yeah, there's a better way. I have one idea, I have another idea, yeah. So, um, you know, there's a better way of doing this. And, um, so I would encourage you, as you make those designs, if you come up with those ideas, make products that understand the world and last and last. And then for all of us, as consumers, we are a very rich country, and, but just because we have disposable incomes doesn't mean we should be buying disposable products. So when you make those decisions of how you make those investments, make, look for products that understand their world and last and last and last. Thank you. All right, Slava Men, yes. How many, uh, how many products does your company make that last and last and last? <laughs> uh, so we have two product lines now, and then this summer we're actually launching, it's not publicly announced, but we're actually launching a Invincible Bicycle. You heard it here first. Yes, breaking news. <laughs> Invincible Bicycle coming. What, uh, I, I, I mean, what was essentially like the, the quickest, easiest, invincible product to make and what's been the hardest? The hardest product was actually the second one. We have it in the corner here. Uh, Lex, Lexi has the one in the corner here. Yeah. What is it? So it's a bike light. And it's a light that locks on your handlebars or seat post and uh, can't be stolen. Uh, it took us over a year to make this. Our first product took us under a year. Our second product took us over a year. It was V1 of this product. It was bigger, it was clunkier. And Version uh, one of the bike light. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what's been the hardest, right? Is it the Invincible Bicycle? Has that been the hardest one so far? It, it was sourcing challenge. Oh, no, the hardest one was this one. The Invincible Bicycle, actually, we learned a lot. So on this mission where we were sourcing things, we actually learned how to manufacture. We learned how to find good suppliers, which is a very hard thing to do when you're a small business. So you've, uh, you've traveled to a lot of places, it sounds like, in, in your talking. Where, um, you know, I'm curious about just the perspective as somebody who rides a bicycle. Where are they doing it really well? And, and what's, what's the sort of gap? What, what are the, like, if you, if you could sort of say, what are the two things we should be doing here to catch up, what would they be? So I haven't been to Amsterdam or Copenhagen, which sounds almost sinful. Um, but I was really surprised and really impressed by Toronto. Uh, 2% of people, t I, from what I understand, there's 2% of people bike there. 
which doesn't sound like a lot, but it feels like the streets are flooded with cyclists, and you're traveling in a safe herd. And I think what they're doing really, and it's cold there, so there's like, you know, we have no excuse not to have that here. I think That's what they're right. doing really well is infrastructure. I think they're doing infrastructure really well, and just kind of like this hardy Canadian spirit. <laughs> that does help. Uh, the, the classic no-grid Boston situation, challenging for everybody. All right, Slava Men, ladies and gentlemen, Thank Slava you. Men. So don't go away, stick around. Uh, we're going to have all of our speakers up on the stage in a couple of minutes. Okay, folks, it is grand finale time, so I'm going to ask all of our speakers to come back up to the stage. Let's, uh, I'm assuming they're still here in the crowd. Kara. Kara Siderman, can I sp please see you at the front of the stage here? Kara Siderman, to the front of the stage. Slava, you still with us? Megan, you guys, there's Megan. Here he comes. Here comes Slava. Yes. First of all, round of applause for these guys. How good were they? Insightful, entertaining, and they all gave something away. Generally, I think there was a lot of there was the theme of today was a lot of giveaways. It's good. So we know that cyclists are gener generous people, generally speaking. Absolutely. So we just want to. I just want to kind of wrap things up with a, you know, with a little bit of a kind of discussion. And uh, interestingly enough, I've been I've been pointing over here to our uh, to our bartender. Again, I used to be a bartender. So another round of applause for the bartender, just to give you a little <laughs> sense of why I'm making sure we're looking out for him. But he pulled me aside and he was asking about, you know, he was saying, "Where is you from? Colombia, or was he in Colombia?" So in Colombia, he was talking about the idea of lots of bike lanes. Uh, I think we call them here protected bike lanes, where the, where the parked cars are on the other side of the bike lane, the bike lanes between traffic and the parked car. Um, is that right? That's one model. That's one model. Yeah. But that's what, that's what you were talking about, right? So that you have, the, you have cars driving, then bike lane, then parked cars, then sidewalk. So uh, in Colombia, he saw a lot of that. There's some of that here, right? Is there, is there movement for more? Kara, Kara, you want to yeah, start there? Yes. So um, the the category of protected bike lane can be anything from, like, um, yes, where you're separating the people who are riding from the moving vehicles, and it can be separated by parked cars. It can be separated by some kind of a barrier. It could be planting strips and or a curb, so like on Vassar Street or on Western Avenue, those are a kind of protected bike lane that are often referred to as cycle tracks. And it is undeniably proven that these are the most safe facilities in urban areas in terms of not, well, they're safe in terms of um, crashes and they also make people feel the most comfortable. And they are also, from a driver's perspective, the best kind of facility which as you can understand, because many of us are drivers as well, that you're, m most people actually would like to just drive safely and get to where they're going. And if people have their own safe, that, their own space that feels comfortable, then it's going to be comfortable and safer for everyone. So these are being expanded in this area. And in Boston, there's, isn't there one on Western Avenue? And there's going to be one on Com Avenue, thanks to many of you who um, advocated for that. <laughs> Um, you know, let me let me pause you there. Let's 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 talk about Calm Avenue a little bit because uh, you know what what we do here is before we come down here and all this, I hang out with these guys for a little while upstairs before we come down and do the event. We chat a little bit, and the Calm Avenue thing came up. Uh, and um, Megan, you were talking about uh, the fact that it turned 180 degrees from where it was in a very quick time. Yep. And so first of all, just for, it sounds like a lot of you guys know what's going on, but talk about what's happening on Kaim Avenue and how it came to pass. Well, I'm not an engineer, so I can't speak to like details, but it's gonna be one of the highlighted projects in the US because you have the green line, you have the university and the people crossing over the green line, and then you have separated bike lanes and intersection treatment, which I know somebody 
Oh, lady in the blue. What is intersection book. treatment? So intersection treatment, um, making sure that when you pull up to a huge intersection that, and Kara will probably be able to answer this much more articulately than I will, that you feel like you know where to go and to get through the intersection as somebody biking. Um, and so it's just going to be an amazing design that's unprecedented in Boston. And yes, it did come 180 degrees because, um, and I'm probably speaking out of turn, um, I'm not the most political person, but um, a year ago uh, on the board of Livable Streets, we were like, this is just not going to happen. It's going to rebuilt, be rebuilt as is. And it was a, a meeting at BU's campus, and I don't know if anybody attended that meeting. Awesome. Um, that turned it. I mean, the transportation commissioner saw it. I got up on stage with my daughter and said, I need safe bike lanes for her for the future. This is not cutting it because we have negative interactions with drivers on the street. So it's, it's a huge victory for all the advocates in the city. <laughs> Microphone carousel. So, I want to throw out kind of a big question, and, and I want you guys all to respond to this. Um, but, you know, I, I heard reference tonight to Amsterdam a number of times, Copenhagen. You talked about Toronto. So these cities that are really, like, forefront in the, like, we're going to make this city available and accessible to people on bicycles. How do we get there? How does Boston get there? And most importantly, keeping in mind, we got some of the converted masses here, people who love to, love to do this already. What, what, can, what can people who are already converted do? And just generally, how do we get there as a city? How far away are we and how do we get there? So uh, Nicole Freeman, former Boston bike star, uh, has this slide and I keep looking back on it often and talks about attitude, attitude towards biking in Boston. And it's this kind of pie chart. And this tiny one sliver is like fearless and you know, ready to do it. And then there's like 20% that are no way, no how. And there's 7% that they're, I probably fall into 7%, but they're, they're you know, comfortable to do it, but they're not going 30 miles an hour down Memorial Drive on a fixie. Uh, and then there's 60% that, as you said earlier, like bike curious. They want to do it, but they don't feel safe doing it. And I think there's two elements to that. I think it's kind of the advocacy and, in, and, and infrastructure stuff, which I'm, I, I don't understand. I'm so glad that people work on this. And our, our thing is also on the gear, because um, when you take your bike somewhere, imagine you took your car and you parked it somewhere, and then you came back, it just wasn't there. And you, your insurance didn't cover it because you don't have insurance for that, but your vehicle's just gone, and that's it. And I think around the 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 gear, the components of it, I think it's kind of in the, in the uh, in Stone Age. So I think it's, it's infrastructure and I think it's around products. Um, so I think that, well, I guess I should say, I lived in Copenhagen for three years and the reason, and my significant other is Danish, and the reason that I went there was because I was so fascinated by a, a country that had transformed itself. Because even though the image now is and it is a fabulous place, one of the top places in the world for biking, it was not always that way. There didn't exist any bike infrastructure in the 1960s. So the fact that they were able to transform from having nothing and have cars everywhere, and now it's a city where people are walking and biking and hardly a car to be seen. Um, one thing that happened there was the um, gas crisis in the 1970s, and that actually for their sake, it was great. So another gas crisis would be great, a serious one. Um, we see that even though it was four dollars a gallon, it wasn't like completely transformative. So short of a gas crisis, so, how do we how do so we sort of <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we so create don't cry a false if the gas, gas crisis? crisis. Goes. So anyway, so one of the things is that um, um, getting partnerships. So it's really important, as we were saying before, that all of you speak up and participate and say what it is you want to see and how you envision your city. The other thing is getting partnerships like with the local business community. And the business community can be great advocates as well. And there's a lot of um, data that shows that people who bike actually spend more money in local businesses than people who drive. And you should go into your local businesses and say, 
I bicycle, I want to bike here more, I want to come to your shop more, and please support us to make this it easier and, and more helpful. And so the citizens in the, in the local business community working together can make a difference. And I think that's one of the things that turned things around when local businesses saw that this was in their, in their interests. That really made a difference as well. Um, and then just, again, biking and doing, and doing it, just being out there and doing it actually can make a difference. You know, Kara, w just a quick follow-up before we move on to Megan on this one is that, uh, you know, because I'm particularly interested because you, you're sort of one of these people involved in, as I was saying earlier, in Hubway, which for me, as somebody who watches how hard things can be to get through city councils, et cetera, like how fast that the Hubway has come together, it's a success. And so, you know, one of my suspicions is that I think that generally speaking, people have a suspicion about how much of an impact they can have by, for example, as you say, like, let your city councilor know, right? Like, there, there's just the sense that it doesn't matter. But as somebody who's kind of on the other side of that, who's, who's, who's seen the effects of the other side of that, does it, like, it does it, does it, like, would you say, like, is it, does it truly help to do that? And, and if so, what do you do? Do you call them on the phone? Do you send them an email? Like, how do you reach out to them? Like, how many people here know who their city councilor is or their alderman or their... <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. I mean, we've got a fairly active amount of people, and I think anybody else knows, you just, you know, you can hop on your phone or the internet and find out who it is if it isn't. But what's the effective way of doing it? Is it, do you send an email? Do you call the office? What do you do? Uh, well, of course, it, I should hasten to say it depends on what it is. I mean, if you have a simple request, like I'd really like more, relatively simple, I'd like more bike racks in this area, there's a local office like my, my office and you can call them up. But if there's a project that's happening and a street project and you really want to advocate, say, for having better bike lanes, then you should write a letter or call or email um, your, and let the elected officials or, or the city leaders know and make it really clear because you better believe that the people who don't want these things to happen are doing a lot of that. And it does make a difference. Every single voice that's voicing something can make a huge difference. So it's the, you know, never underestimate the power of the, the voice of the citizen, definitely. The apps. Oh, the the apps. question is, what are the names of the apps? What are yeah. the names of the, so um, that's for the, the smaller stuff that will get fixed, I promise you. Um, iReport is the one in Cambridge, and uh, Citizens Connect is the one in Boston, and I don't know the ones in the other cities. By the way, I have to say, um, does anybody know how many, what percentage of people bike to work in Cambridge, of Cambridge residents? Percentage of people who bike to work in Cambridge. I got a three over here, I got a, I heard seven. Ten. <laughs> Almost, it's, it's, it so every year we do the census, so it's between seven and nine percent. Wow, um, it's so huge. <laughs> Round of applause for the city of Cambridge. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, and then one other thing about partnerships, I will throw this in, and so I talked about the local businesses, but one of the other things that's really important is the uh, employers, and I mentioned that um, I was talking to somebody else about how supportive a lot of the employers in Cambridge are for getting Hubway memberships for their employees, and they are very supportive of having people get to work by biking in general, I'm making a generalization, but that's another area is talk to, to places that you work and say, you know, I really want to do this. Can you help support Hubway or can you help support more bike racks or you can help? And if they see that it's something that their employees are asking for, then then they will be, and we have a lot of great employers in Cambridge, so um, that's another really positive partnership. So let them know as well what you're thinking. There you go. Practical stuff. That's good. That's good. All right, Megan, how do we get there? How do we get to where we want to be? <laughs> All right. This is super controversial. Yes, finally, some controversy. Hashtag reinvent the minivan. That is how we get us to be to that next level, because you look at pictures of Copenhagen and Amsterdam, you see families getting around and call it the canary in the coal mine. But until we solve the problem that mothers don't feel safe enough to bike their kids around, we will never get there. I, and I know this because I have friends that are bike advocates, advocates and when they had their first child, they bought a car. <laughs> they bought a minivan. <laughs> Somebody knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> um, but until we solve this safety problem, we're not going to get there. And it's, exp I mean, so, m like, Montreal, I don't know what their 
percentage of people biking. That's but okay. if you go there, it's just phenomenal. Um, but you see families biking around. And, and then in Copenhagen, it's like one out of every two people bikes. And it's because the moms, you know, do their fair share of biking the kids around. Um, yeah, so reinvent the minivan. So if you're not a mom, if it, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be a mother, no matter how hard I try. So if you're not a mother, what can you do? Can you, can you participate in that somehow to, to move that forward? Yeah. So you can support family family slash transportation bike shops. And there's a new one in, in the Boston area called Bicycle Bell. And for all the ladies in the crowd, um, it's barely on the Somerville border, like Com Cambridge Somerville border. But for all the ladies in the crowd, we host uh, second Friday of every month, Bells Who Bike, which is a happy hour from 6 to 8, wine, cheese, Lady talk. Sounds like Boston talks. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, no, no it does. Um, but come out. There's all the great bike porn in the background. They have fem They have uh, women's bikes, family bikes, and um, and men's bikes. So support your local family bike shop. Cool. Carrie, you had something. I did have something to say, which is um, one of the other things that we're doing and is happening in a lot of places is to create more extensive um, supportive systems in the schools. So we just started a Safe Routes to School program. And a lot of places are really ramping up and trying to do things to make it easier to get like to school, because that's the obvious transportation, but also to teach kids about um, how to bike and walk. And this is big, this is really big, and we are s we're really thrilled that we're starting a much bigger program in Cambridge. And I, other places are doing it too. So support those things as well, because this is our next generation, and it's the future. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Slava, Kara, Megan, one more round of applause for them. Huge round of applause for yourselves. Thank you guys for coming out for Boston Talks.